So the first thing, I covered to you why the modern Bibles, they're all wrong. So I covered all the errors and showed you what's wrong with those verses in the modern Bible versions. So as we continue our teaching concerning about modern Bible versions, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of a history and then some common objections to the King James Bible issue. By understanding these facts, then you can be more established on the two main foundations. Again, the King James Bible issue and dispensationalism. That's what makes our church different from other churches in this Bay Area. And all Bible-believing churches that are like us, that's what distinguishes all of us from the majority of apostate churches is the dispensationalism issue and the King James Bible issue. Okay, so what you've got to understand is that the modern Bible versions, they are influenced by the Alexandrian text. So amongst the scholastic world, there are about four main family lines of manuscripts, but scholars will generalize into two to make things simple. So then the two main lines for manuscripts is Alexandrian, and the other one is known as the Byzantine. Now these manuscripts are from Syria. We like to call them Antiochian manuscripts. So uh, this is not an exact correct term, but I'm just writing it like this way in reference to Antioch. So that's where our scriptures come from, the King James Bible. So scholars will generally believe that modern Bible versions are mainly from Alexandrian texts and the King James is from Antiochian. Now understand this, not every verse in modern versions are from Alexandrian. That's important to understand. And not every verse in the King James Bible is from Antiochian Byzantine. That's important to understand. We believe that mainly, mainly this group of manuscript family is where the King James Bible came from, and mainly the modern versions came from this line of manuscripts, the Alexandrian. So that's what secular scholars will believe, okay? That's what secular scholars will believe. That's why I'm putting out that disclaimer. Now, what we King James Bible believers believe in is that the King James Bible, it came from everything from the Antioch Byzantine manuscript. That's what we believe. Everything came from here. That's where the Word of God came from. So, if you watch my video, which is what I'm not going to teach today, Inspiration and Preservation in Basic Discipleship, which you all should have listened to that audio homework. If you listened to that audio homework lesson, it would have told you how the Bible is the perfect pure words of God even today. So we believe that what the apostles and prophets, what they originally wrote, that they, were, that they were copies made out of the originals. And then there were translations of those copies. And then through that, we believe that it came from this line, Antioch and Byzantine. That's what we believe in. So Acts chapter 11 will show you where the word of God came from, actually. You'll notice in Acts chapter 11, and then we'll read verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Look at verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now, you'll also notice right here that at verse uh, 19, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and where? Antioch, where? Preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So you'll notice right here that the Bible already gave you a clue. If you want the closest area for the word of God, it's going to be located in Antioch. As a matter of fact, that's where they were first called Christians. Look at verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So you'll notice right here that that's where the word of God originally started and Christianity. Now, what about Alexandria, though? If you look up every verse in the Bible that talks about Alexandria, it is a negative reference. 
Alexandria came from Egypt. See, it's a city located in Egypt. Now, what do you think the Bible says about Egypt? Nothing good, right? So that's why we believe that if you want to find the right Bible, you're obviously going to have to go to here. Now, here's a disclaimer, okay? Another disclaimer that's important to understand is that, first of all, the first disclaimer is mainly, right, for modern versions. They came from Alexandrian. You don't want to say every verse. You want to say mainly. This is the ma uh, manuscript family. The second thing you want to understand, a second disclaimer, is to understand that there are modern versions that will be claimed to come from this family. So here's a great example. One example is the NKJV, which is the New King James Version. They brag that this actually came from the Antiochian Byzantine manuscript. So we'll just put BY here, okay? BY, that's where it came from. So that's what they're gonna claim the New King James Bible came from. Now, the reason, the way you can argue against modern versions who do come from this family, Antioch and Byzantine, yet they're still wrong and the KJV is right, is simple. What you have to do is that you have to pick out verses. So in this case, even though it came from the Byzantine, the red mark, the problem is this. There are verses that are not Byzantine. They are Alexandrian. So then, how this is proven is if you go to our video about modern versions, remember our previous intermediate discipleship video? We covered some problems with the New King James Version. And if you look at those problems, you're going to notice where the New King James Version, it matched with the modern versions rather than the King James Bible. Why would it do that? Because it's following the Alexandrian type of manuscripts. So then the main line of Alexandrians Bibles, they are the NIV and the ESV, and then the NASV, and then the New Living Translation, and then I'll just put plus more. So these are the most famous modern versions, though. These are the most famous modern versions. Admittedly, scholars will confess that they came from Alexandrian family. But they're going to argue that the New King James Version, and there's going to, they're going to pull up other Bibles too, that they came from Antiochian. So all you have to do is look at our Intermediate Discipleship number one video and, then and go through all those verses and see where the New King James Bible just copycatted the modern versions. By doing that, then you can prove that the New King James Version, it is uh, following Alexandrian verses. So that's important to understand. All right, so this is the history. Now, another important disclaimer is this. Another important disclaimer to understand is that, remember, mainly scholars will say the King James Bible does not come from Antioch and Byzantine. So Antioch and Byzantine, this was later coined as the Textus Receptus. This is where the New Testament of the King James Version came from. The Old Testament came from the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Masora. So out of these two texts, that's where our King James Bible came from. Now, that's what scholars will admit as well. The secular scholars know that the New King James, I mean, excuse me, the New Testament of the King James Version comes from Textus Receptus, and the Old Testament of the King James Version comes from the Masoretic Text. Now, this is what they're going to do. Those modern secular scholars, they're going to try to point out verses in the Textus Receptus that differs from the KJV, and they're going to pull up verses in the Masoretic Text that differs from the KJV. That's what they're going to do. By doing that, then they prove right here that the King James Bible, it, it does have errors, that it's not infallible. Because if you believe that this is perfect, the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, then why are there differences with the English King James Version? So a lot, this is important to understand, the majority of IFB churches who are King James only, they believe that the Textus Receptus is the infallible, perfect, pure word of God. 
And when you hear that, that should be a red light, and they are not truly King James only. That is important to understand. The reason why is this, is that if there's going to be a difference with the Textus Receptus and King James Version, they're going to choose the Textus Receptus. Now, those who think that the King James Ber Version is perfect and the Textus Receptus is perfect, they're really dumb. And secular scholars really look down on you on that one. So then, there are, there are some cult pastors out there that majority of IFB churches separate themselves from. And these guys are anti-Semite and post-trib guys. And these numbskulls, they think that this is perfect, the Greek New Testament and the English King James Version is perfect. Well, that's bull. That's just garbage. So why do I slam them really hard? Because these guys are rebel rousers who are not part of the IFB movement. These guys are rebel rousers who went rogue, and they're, trying to, they're grabbing a lot of onliners. That's the reason why I'm mentioning these people, because I don't want you onliners watch these guys get fooled by them. Oh, they believe the King James Bible is perfect. No, if you follow along those guys, then you're going to get swept away by them, it, by this rebel rogue. Mostly they're a rebel rogue group. Majority of IFB churches, they're not a large YouTube channel. Remember that. All right, they're not a large YouTube channel. The largest independent fundamentalist Baptist church with a YouTube channel, and I'm talking about church, okay? I'm not talking about Bible believer, I'm talking about church, is our channel. So if you see uh, an IFB church that's over 20,000 subscribers, then that's most likely going to be part of this uh, new IFB fringe cult. Majority of IFB churches, even those that have like 5,000 members, they disassociate from this new IFB group. So I just want to let you guys know that, all right? Don't watch those guys. They're really rogue. They're not one of us. Okay, but anyway, uh, this is a dumb argument where they think this is perfect and this is perfect. This is perfect, this is perfect. The reason why this is a dumb argument is because there are differences, and secular scholars will point that out. Now, this is how you get away with it. This is very important to understand. We believe all manuscripts. That's the idea. So this is where we put the correction against the secular scholars. We believe in all manuscripts in line with the Antiochian Byzantine. That's the idea. You might say, why is that? Because you got to understand this. When we argue on Antiochian Byzantine manuscripts, we're not simply saying Greek. We're talking about all manuscripts that came from that Greek line. So, for example, there are many different Bibles that came out of this. So, there is two of the oldest manuscripts that you want to mark down is the Old Latin and then the Syriac Peshitta. These two manuscripts can be proven to be as early as the second century. These modern versions, their two famous manuscripts that they boast are Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. These are also second century manuscripts. So the reason why modern versions, scholars, want to use the Alexandrian text this is their excuse. Their excuse is, this is older. That's the famous argument that you want to remember. It's older. And the two main groups are these guys. These are second century. Now, the problem with this argument is that, but notice right here, that the Byzantine also consists of older manuscripts that are second century. These two guys, see that? So that's a lame argument. Here's another factor to understand, which is going to be very powerful. Do you know that 90 to, let's see, I'm going to give the lowest estimate, 85%, and that one is actually a false statistic. So, but I'm just going to give the critics the benefit of the doubt, the lowest is 85%. The highest is 99% probably 0.9%. That's the highest. That's the majority 
of Greek manuscripts that support this line right here. Didn't you know that? So, Textus Receptus is known to be as high as 99.9%. Lowest is 85%. And secular scholars, secular scholars agree majority of Greek manuscripts support the Textus Receptus. By the way, if you look up their New Testament Greek textbooks, they admit that the Textus Receptus is the majority of all manuscripts. So the reason why they want to go by a minority rather than majority is because the excuse that it's older. Remember that. But remember, the King James Bible or the Antioch and Byzantine or Textus Receptus manuscripts, they also have older manuscripts as well. So it doesn't change that fact. Another thing is this. What's also very powerful to use concerning older text is the church fathers. There are statements from church fathers that also back up the percentage of the Greek manuscripts. By using these three groups, you'll find that their statement about, oh, it's older, is going to be false. So these three are going to work quite often. Now, this is very minuscule, but I'll mention this, okay? But this is pretty minuscule. The papyrus. Papyrus are the oldest manuscripts ever, actually. Papyrus. Papyrus are considered to be the oldest manuscripts ever. That's why they like to do Alexandrian, because... Do you know where the papyri material came from? It came from Egypt, right? So papyrus manuscripts, they come from Alexandria, Egypt. So because they have the papyrus manuscripts, that's why they're going to argue we like to use Alexandrian text better because they have older ones over here. But remember, there are two problems with this, which I covered in this video. And if you want to write it down, you can write this one down in case you didn't write this down. One, where's the location at? Alexandria, Egypt. Why, if I, it doesn't matter how old it is. What if I picked up a Bible that was written by a Satanist at the early BCs? Does that make it right? No, that doesn't make it right. What if I pick up a Bible from a person who's a pagan worshiper, but who claimed to be a Christian, and the manuscript is the oldest manuscript, B.C.'s. Does that make it right? No, it doesn't make it right. See, so older doesn't mean it's better. That's the problem. Older doesn't mean it's better. You've got to realize this. If you look at the background between Alexandria and Antioch, which one's more Christian? See that? So what you do is that you pick the manuscripts that comes from a more trustworthy area where the Lord picked. That's the idea. By the way, just because you have older manuscripts here, like I told you again, if you go by these four points, you're going to find an older reading. You're going to find a uh, KJV with an older reading that will support your Byzantine line. There will be. Okay, so let me give some other arguments right here. So these are three disclaimers that you want to keep in mind that there's a lot of misunderstandings that secular scholars will accuse you of. So make sure you understand these three disclaimers, and then I gave you counter-arguments to this, and I gave you a full history. Now remember, we believe the King James Bible came from all manuscripts in line of Antioch and Byzantine. So what do we mean by all manuscripts? That's where I mentioned to you, see, Old Latin. So where there's a Greek manuscript, if a KJV doesn't have a Greek manuscript support, usually you'll find Old Latin supporting it. Usually, Old Latin makes up 90, if not 100% of the time, where the Greek manuscript failed. You can also use, there's also a Syriac Peshitta. There are church fathers. There are even papyrus manuscripts. But the Antiochian manuscripts, you've got to understand this. This is famously called the tradi traditional text. Sometimes scholars would like to call this a traditional text. So you'll notice that this line has many different names. It'll be TR, Antioch, and Byzantine, traditional, whatever. 
Textus Receptus, remember, is Greek only. If you use traditional, this is going to be better. Why is traditional a better term? Because traditional text, it's going to take all the Greek manuscripts and take all the other manuscripts that were in line with the Textus Receptus or Antioch. So then Old Latin came out after the Greek originals in Antioch. Old Latin, that's really close, second century. And then the Syriac Peshitta. Notice Syriac, right? Antioch is located where? Syria. So Syriac Peshitta, these two are second centuries. Not only that, before the English King James Bible came out, you got to think about this. When the KJV translators were translating your Bible, do you think they only used these two manuscripts? Groups. No, they didn't use the, just these two manuscript families. They took all manuscripts that were birthed out of here, Antioch Byzantine, and then they picked the best words out of all of them and then gave you the King James Bible. When you argue that way, you're going to be on the safe side debating about manuscripts and about words. So then, what were all the other manuscripts that came out? We got Old Latin, Syriac, Peshitta, church, uh, certain church father statement, certain papyri statements. But uh, you also have right here, Diodati, Italian. You also have Valera, Spanish. You also have um, the Old English, Wycliffe. You also have, let's see, we already mentioned Old Latin, uh, Olivetan's French. And then you also got um, the Polyglot Bible. You also got the Polyglot Bible as well. And then there are other languages that I don't know from the top of my head right now. Oh, there's Luther German as well. There's Luther's German. But the idea is this, see, the King James Bible translators, they were taking all the different translations. So Tin Wycliffe graduated to Tyndale. Let me put that in. And then let me put Erasmus right here. Erasmus is the one responsible for compiling the TR to begin with, actually. But here's another thing. TR is not just one. There are as many. So I'm going to give a small to the largest estimate. There's approximately somewhere between seven to probably 14 different editions of the TR. So you'll notice that the KJV translators, they took all of this combined together. And then they gave you a superior Bible. That's why the King James Bible is better than your Textus Receptus. That's why the King James Bible is better than your Hebrew Masera. Why is that? Because we took all of the Bibles that traditional Christians before us have used as the word of God. Now, when you look at that line, then whose Bible you want to use? Don't you want to use the Bible of the martyrs back then? The people who bled and gave up their lives, who worked so hard to translate your Bible? The one who uh, uh, opposed the Catholic Church system? The ones who stood for the Word of God? And who are Protestant Christian? Protestant Christian. So obviously we want to use these manuscripts. Then why all of a sudden do you want to turn to some kind of philosophical Egyptian pagan area, huh? Isn't that something you should think about? Isn't that a problem right here? So why would scholars chew that? Because they're scholars. Scholars like to go by scholars. That's the problem. If you want something close to Christian, then look at the fruits. By their fruits ye shall know them, the Bible says. Whose fruits look better? See, that's the idea. They can use certain scholastic arguments, older is better, but that's just going to be false because I pointed out these certain things that you could point out that's older as well. They're going to uh, point out that, well, a large number of papyri support the Alexandrian. Well, that don't matter just because uh, their, their papyri manuscript, which is the oldest manuscripts, older doesn't mean that it's right. I pointed that out to you. Okay, so... Establish this uh, historical area, you'll understand the history of your King James Bible. So this is the history of your King James Bible that you want to understand and know about. Okay, so I'm going to erase this right now. <laughs> I am going to erase this right now. Okay, so understand this basic history. 
of the King James Bible. That way you can get a better idea. Oh, okay, I see why we use the King James Bible. Oh, okay, I see why we go for manuscript evidence-wise, what we can argue right here. That's why you're going to notice, um, so I'm kind of giving a little giveaway over here. This is supposed to be something that I say in advanced discipleship, but I'm going to say it here, just this little statement. That's why I'm very good in debating. Sometimes you notice in my videos, I can, I, when I play a level playground with the scholars, you notice how I'll quote manuscripts, quote Greek, Hebrew, stuff like that. The reason why is this is the outline. This is my framework. So if you understand this framework, everything will become natural with other arguments. You just go by more specifics after that. Okay, now, now that you understand why we only use the King James Bible and why we reject all, and I mean all modern versions, is because of this history. All right, now we're gonna, uh, I'm going to cover some main arguments that are used against the King James Bible. So here are the main arguments that are used against the King James Bible, and then we'll call it a night. Okay, so the first argument that they're going to use, which is pretty famous, is that the King James Bible is hard to understand. Right? Uh, that's the most famous argument, right? That's why they're going to go to the modern versions. Why? Because it's easier to understand. KJV, hard to understand, whereas modern versions are easy. Now, how you can argue against this is to point out that if the Bible was made very easy to understand, then that is not considered to be the Word of God. Now, you might say, why is that? Because, have you ever read your Bible? Do you think that the Old Testament Jews who had it in their language in Hebrew, do you think they understood everything about the Word of God? No, right? In fact, some things are difficult to understand, right? That's the idea. Isn't the Word of God supposed to be sometimes hard to understand because it takes studying? It takes efforts of studying. Here's another example. Jesus preached in the common language, common tongue of the common people. But remember, there are so many verses where it says that people did not understand what Jesus spoke, right? See, so you got to understand this. If the Bible was made in a way where you can plainly and easily understand, then that's not even considered to be the Word of God. The Word of God is deliberately made in that way where you're supposed to study words where you're supposed to compare Scripture with Scripture. Look at the context to understand. So this is not a good excuse. KJV, hard to understand. Well, even if the words, so here's the idea. Even if the words were made easier, it doesn't change the fact that people in the Bible still find it hard to understand. The people heard Jesus speaking in their common language, common tongue, and they still had a hard time understanding. So that's not a good argument to use just because it's easier. Here's another thing right here. Another thing is, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that spiritual things are not to be understood at first. Spiritual things, what they are is they're pretty difficult at the beginning, but what happens is when you're, when you're spiritually growing, then what happens? It gets easier to understand. So to make things easier is not the beginning. It should be when you're reading. When you're reading more and more and more and more, then it gets easier. Now, I don't know if any of you read your Bible often, but how many of you have read your Bible at the beginning and said, man, it's hard to understand. But now, after like consistently reading, it became easier and easier. And not only that, it became easier to read than school textbooks. How many of you can raise your hand? Yeah, see that? Now, my greatest evidence is Tom right here. Because I remember at the beginning, when he got saved, he was telling me that it was so hard to understand the Bible. And uh, he was mourning about that. And I told him, hey, brother, just stick around during Bible study classes. Don't worry, just keep reading. And what's going to happen is you're going to be surprised how much easier it's going to be. 
Now he reached a point where now it became easier than school textbooks now. See, that's the idea of the Word of God. It's supposed to be easier to you when you grow in it, when you read it. To put it down in your level, easy at the beginning, that shows that's not something spiritual then. What's that? That's fleshy then. That's something fleshy. All right, the second argument that they're going to use is that the KJV has archaic words. Why? Because it's, it's in Old English. Now, the easy argument against this is, now this is a scholastic argument. A scholastic argument is, if you look at all the English Bibles, they have very poor English. The ESV, that's the one that they praise the most because it's getting close to a KJV kind of wording. But here's an undoubtable fact, and I attended school at UC Berkeley, and even the professor who's a Jew even admitted this. He's, he criticized all modern versions, so MV, modern versions, and then he praised the KJV Bible instead on its English. Why is this elevated up? You know why? Because, the, let me ask you this question. Schools, they don't like it when you change Shakespeare's wordings, right? Why? Because of that rich English, Elizabethan English that has a lot of meaning. What's the highest, most praised English ever in the English language? It's Elizabethan English. That's Shakespearean English. You know where the KJV came from? Elizabethan, Shakespearean English. Use your head now. If God wants to give you the best Bible in your language, you think he's going to pick some dumb American accent language for your Bible? Or he's going to pick Elizabethan Shakespearean English? See, God gives you what's the best in your own language. So obviously, just why keep the archaic words? Well, you don't want to change Shakespeare, so why do you want to change the King James Bible, huh? That shows what kind of spirit you have. That's a strange spirit you have. You don't mind secular works, but then when it comes to the Word of God, you want to change it, huh? So that's the idea, is that why retain the archaic words? Because it's great. It's the best English language ever. But here's the second argument. A second argument is it's not as archaic as you think. Now, one book that I would highly recommend, you don't have to buy it, but I would highly recommend is to buy Lawrence Vance's book. Lawrence Vance's book. He was the man who actually taught me Greek during my first years. But he's a brilliant man. He has a thick book called Archaic Words and the Authorized Version. Archaic Words and the Authorized Version. It's this thick. If you look at that book, he pulls up every, he pulls up all these archaic words in the King James Bible, and he compares this with modern articles today, even like uh, as plain as different magazines. And not only that, he even takes out different modern versions as well, using the same archaic words, proving that they're not as archaic as you think. They're, just, they're used in everyday language just like we use today. So that's what he proves right there. So it's not really as archaic as you think. So these are the most common arguments against your King James Bible. The other arguments I co concerning manuscript-wise, I already covered it. I already covered in my other teaching. But these are the main verses that you want to use. The last one I want to use is this, which is going to be important, the last one. They're going to point out contradictions and errors in your King James Bible. KJV contradictions. So there are two things that I want to recommend to you. Concerning about so-called errors in your King James Bible, there are two things that I would highly recommend. You know what? One of them you should buy. So this is mandatory. You should buy this. Okay. One of them is called the errors in the King James Bible. Errors in the King James Bible. This is by Peter S. Ruckman, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. He was my teacher. So this man right here, he covers all the famous contradiction in your King James Bible. Now, have you ever had atheists trying to point out like 100 or 200 different errors in your King James Bible? Yeah, so Dr. Upman, he covers those errors. So that's why that book is highly recommended. Errors in the King James Bible. The second thing that I'd recommend for you 
So this is not mandatory, the second one, but this is the one that I'd recommend. The one that I recommend to you is to watch my playlist. It's called Defending the KJV. Go to our YouTube channel, watch the playlist Defending the KJV. That one will cover all the other different arguments that are used against the King James Bible. It will also cover textual issues, textual issues. So you can watch that one. But when they try to point out con uh, textual errors in your King James Bible, the most famous line that you can use is what I showed you in my previous drawing. Compare with the old Latin, old Syriac. Compare with the uh, statements of church fathers. And not only that, compare all the other different versions that came from the Antioch and Byzantine manuscripts. Compare with Spanish Valera, Luther's German, Wycliffe's English, Tyndale's English, etc., etc. Throughout all that, then you can support your argument on the textual reading as well. That's what you're going to notice in my videos. And I just gave you away a little secret of mine on uh, doing a manuscript evidence arguments. So that's a big giveaway. But if you watch my Defending the KJV playlist, you'll catch the idea how I do it. They like to use lexicons and concordances on you to prove the right Greek and Hebrew interpretation. But the simple argument against that is they're just picking and choosing Greek lexicons, just like they're picking and choosing manuscripts to prove a textual error. You just keep finding other lexicons out there, and you'll find a word a term or a definition that'll support your KJV reading. Yeah, so they're picking and choosing. Remember that scholars, they're just picking and choosing. You can find it too yourself. So the issue then is, then how do we find the right Bible? The right Bible is when you look at the history, see? When you look at the history, then you know. But not only that, the video that I pointed out, Inspiration and Preservation, told you there has to be a perfect, pure word of God. So then there's only one. Which one is it? Because all Bibles are, differentiate from each other. We covered that in our last discipleship, right? They're not all the same. So then the KJV is the best candidate when you look at all of that. Okay, so this covers everything about the King James Bible issue. Lord willing, next time it will be dispensationalism. So that will be the most fun. But dispensationalism, I'm just going to make cover all the basics like I did with the KJV. So we'll cover it in two lessons, Lord willing. So <coughs> your homework assignment will be posted at the end of this video. God, my Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray that tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, 
As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that He died, buried, and resurrected so that His blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.